Hello, I'm Bill Simpson, and I'm going to be telling you today about how we use UV visible spectroscopy to measure atmospheric gases and then also aerosol particles in the atmosphere. The basic idea is that gases absorb at certain wavelengths that we know, certain wavelengths, and each of these absorption patterns are unique to the gases. The more a gas is present, the larger the absorption amount. So by fitting the absorption patterns, we can determine how much of various gases are around. We typically want to know where these gases are in the atmosphere, so what we'll usually do is have an instrument down near the ground and have that instrument view tangent through a layer that is near the horizon where they'll pick up large absorptions of a gas that's down low and then scan up through the atmosphere. Scanning up through the atmosphere, we're looking higher and higher layers in the atmosphere, and that'll allow us to determine a profile of the trace gas that we're looking at. So today we're going to be talking first about how the uh, amounts of the gases are measurement how the amounts of the gases are measured and then after that I'm going to have a separate tutorial about how we fit that to a elevation profile. The underlying basis for this absorption spectroscopy is the Beer-Lambert law and it's ex expressed in math right here as the natural log of I over I naught is equal to minus sigma n L. Walking you through what each of these things are, I is the intensity of the measurement, I naught is the intensity without the absorbing gas. This ratio, I over I naught, is unitless, which is necessary for us to take its natural log. So we get a pure number on the left-hand side, so the right-hand side must also be, also be a pure number, and that works out because the cross-section, molecular cross-section sigma, has the unit of centimeter squared per molecule, the molecular number density has molecules per centimeter cubed, and then the path length is in centimeters. And if you multiply each of those out, you find the result is unitless. So the ratios of these intensities are going to give you the number density if you know the path length. In atmospheric spectroscopy, we often average over paths that are pretty long where the number density will vary. So the uh, actual n times l is often measured as a product and then integrated over the path. And we call that the slant column density. In this simple example, n times l is just the slant column density, and that's in units of molecules per centimeter squared. And uh, that slant column density is what we're after today. We want to measure the slant column density of various gases. And we're going to be able to do that because we know the absorption patterns, the cross-section of various gases, and we can measure I and I naught in the atmosphere. And so therefore the only thing we need to get out is the slant column density S. Okay. This is spectroscopy. We're actually measuring not just intensity at one wavelength, but intensity at multiple wavelengths, a spectrum of usually 2048 elements, uh, some large number of wavelengths. So I, I naught, and sigma are all functions of wavelengths, uh, while the slant column density is just going to be a number that scales the molecular cross-section to get the uh, to match the left-hand side here. So let's look at those spectrum. But first I want to talk about the instrumentation that we use. It's a very simple setup for this type of atmospheric spectroscopy. You have a telescope which is going to look at a certain point in the sky. You have a spectrometer which is going to separate that light that you receive from that point in the sky into intensity versus wavelength. And we're going to measure spectra, just raw intensity or even uncorrected counts, versus pixel number at various view geometries, and we'll call that an elevation profile. Here's a picture of the UAF MAX-DOAS instrument. 
on the left hand side here is the receiver the telescope and you're looking down this little eyeball here is where the light is coming from uh, the light is then turned with a prism here and sent into this fiber optic to be analyzed in the spectrometer that fiber optic then connects over and comes into this region here where it'll be separated by this spectrometer and then there's a single board computer and a stepper motor driver that turns where this telescope points. So it's a very simple instrument. Ours uses about three watts of power and it's relatively inexpensive so you can deploy a lot of these out there and get a picture of where gases are both horizontally and vertically in the atmosphere. This is one of our instruments deployed on a CI site. The actual receiver you'll identify up here, and then the fiber optic feeds down to underneath the sea ice, and we use the uh, water down here, which is at about the freezing point of seawater, to thermostat the spectrometer. You usually want very good temperature control on the spectrometer. We also have some tilt meters in here to sense the uh, tilt of the instrument so we can know where the true horizon is, and a frost detector and a defrost system to keep our window clean. But overall, it's a very simple system, and it's going to produce data uh, that we can uh, observe, observe gases out uh, on the sea ice. We're going to be talking about different levels of data. And these are parallel to NASA standard data levels that we talk about. And these data levels are level zero being simple, raw, instrumental data records. Uh, there's no standard format for these things, um, but generally each group will use its own format for a level zero data product. They're uncalibrated, so they're not really uh, shareable between groups generally. Level 1 data are now calibrated spectra, where the intensity is a true intensity and the wavelength is a calibrated wavelength. The intensity is going to typically be in counts per second, but zero counts per second meaning zero light. Uh, you may also calibrate this to a true radiometric uh, unit, that is to say watts per meter squared per steradian or something like that. But because I and I naught are going to be in the same units, it doesn't actually matter whether you're in counts per second or in a true radiometric unit for the DOAS analysis that I'm going to be talking about. Once you have calibrated spectra, you can then fit them to get slant column densities of various gases as a function of u-geometry. And we refer to this as level 2 data. And the point of this uh, tutorial is to get us to level 2 data. From level 2 data, we'll take the elevation profiles and turn them into vertical profiles of gases or aerosols. And we call these level 3 data typically gridded in time. There's some loss of resolution in time going between these two levels, between level 2 and level 3. We typically go to hourly or half hourly data products for the sea ice project that we've been worked on, working on shorter time resolution if we have the bandwidth to get data off at a faster time resolution, typically maybe 10, 20 minutes. Okay, again, we're just going to be measuring the light that is in the atmosphere at a certain elevation angle. The idea is that the light's coming in from the sun, it's going to be scattered somewhere, and then we're going to measure the absorption along this path in reference to viewing straight up through the atmosphere to determine slant column densities in the atmosphere. And this reference by Gerd Hunninger is a great paper to, to understand this method. Okay, so here are two spectra that we've got from the Arctic Ocean, and these spectra are in counts per second on the vertical axis right here as a function of wavelength here. And you'll note this is in the ultraviolet region from the solar cutoff at something like 300 nanometers. This is due to ozone absorption that there's no light here through to longer wavelengths out into the blue here. The visible starts at about 400 nanometers. I show two spectra here, a measurement spectrum at one degree elevation above the horizon, that's the red spectrum, and another spectrum at 90 degree elevation, which we'll call the zenith, a reference measurement straight up.
And this measurement was made by our instrument Oboy 10 on April 25th, 2014 at 2045 UTC, which was at this location, lat long, and this solar zenith angle right here. So uh, we get these type of spectra, and the first thing you'll see in the, these spectra is that uh, you've got a bunch of features that are common to the reference spectrum and to the measurement spectrum. So both the red and blue spectra have a lot of the same features. These dips here are due to absorptions, but they're actually absorptions in the sun's photosphere. So in the outer uh, gases around the sun, we have absorption by ver via various different metal atoms, calcium, iron, various things like that, which cause all these dips. And the great spectroscoper Fraunhofer saw these dips and called these Fraunhofer dips. So these Fraunhofer dips are there both in the eye measurement and the eye reference. And if we take their ratio, they will largely disappear because they're not in Earth's atmosphere, they're instead in the light source of the sun. These are kind of a bane to us because they are uh, clearly interfering with trace gases that I would like to measure. They're all throughout this region. Um, but they're very good because they give us absolute wavelength standards occurring all the way up throughout this region. So they can be used for wavelength calibration very effectively. Again, we're going to use Beer's Law to get rid of these by taking the ratio of I and I naught. And that's this next slide. So here we have the natural log of I measurement over I reference. And you'll see, although this is largely the same spectral region, now we go from 315 through about uh, 445 or something like that, 430, I'm sorry, 450, uh, what we see is that all those strong dips have gone away. And that's because uh, we have ratioed them out, essentially. So that's good. But we see small features, this little dip here, we see small dips here, but these dips aren't very large uh, in our spectra because the biggest thing that's going on between those two spectra is a difference in light scattering, and that causes these broad, broad features right here. So this broad curve we're going to remove by a polynomial and that polynomial is shown as this dashed line right here. And by removing that polynomial, we'll be able to look more at the molecular absorbers, which are things like this one right here. This is actually the collisional complex of two oxygen molecules, O4. This is O4, and some of these features that are very hard to see right here are due to the gas we're interested in, bromine monoxide. So what we're now going to do is uh, we took I over I naught, now we're going to take out that polynomial. So we're going to switch through and take out that polynomial reference and look at what's left over after that. So this is now the natural log of I over I naught where I've removed the polynomial. And I now see these distinct dips right here. These dips are due to molecules. And molecules have somewhat broader features than do the atoms in the sun's atmosphere. So one of the biggest things about DOA spectroscopy is we rely on the fact that molecular absorbers have broader spectra than atomic absorbers in order to get at this method. So this feature right here is that oxygen collisional dimer. Some of these features in here are due to the bromine monoxide molecule. These strong features here are due to ozone. So different absorbers are showing up, and by fitting this spectrum, we're going to be able to get at those various different absorbers. OK, another thing to notice is that we're now down to the level of this is 10 times 10 to the minus 3, and we can start to see the noise. Probably the noise level is about a half times 10 to the minus 3, or 5 times 10 to the minus 4 is typical for our instrument. So that's down at the noise. All these other features, like these little ones right here, and these ones, and these ones, are due to things that we want to determine, slant column densities of various different gases. 
Okay, so we fit our spectra using a, sp a program called QDOS, which is an updated version of a former program called WinDOS that many people still use. It's pretty much equivalent to another uh, software called Doasis or Doasis. And uh, these uh, programs fit both that polynomial and various different trace gases simultaneously in a, non, in a linear, nonlinear, least square fit to get the best combination of that polynomial and various different gaseous absorptions. Once we do that fitting, we'll get slant column densities of each of the gases that we've allowed that fit to consider, and we call those level two data. And those are slant column densities as uh, from that intensity of that measurement versus that reference. What I'm going to do now is shift over to a uh, different operating system and start to look at those fits. This is the interface of QDOS's software, which is showing some spectral fits that we are getting uh, from the spectra that we've just been looking at. So first off here is we've got a window that we're considering in terms of our fit. In this case, the window is 346 nanometers to 364 nanometers. And this is the spectrum and the reference that are shown right here. Um, this spectrum then is fit to various different absorbers that are shown in each of these different windows. Let me start with this gas right here. This is bromine monoxide. And what you see is that bromine monoxide, the blue line shows you the uh, laboratory measurement convolved with our instrumental resolution. And then the uh, dashed line, the, the slightly spiky line, is showing us the uh, measured spectrum showing just the part that's due to the bromine monoxide absorption. And then this number here, 4.43 times 10 to the 14th is molecules per centimeter squared, is the number dense, the slant column density of BRO that is the result of this fit right here. So we can look through at various different absorbers that we're going to have. I said that that feature at 360 nanometers, 360.8 is actually the peak of it, was due to the O4 molecule, the O2 collisional dimer. There was a little bit of feature due to ozone. This window is picked to actually not have too much ozone feature in it, so there's not that much of it. And then other absorbers like NO2 may be there. Very small amount of NO2 is found in this. Not sure if that's real or not. And then we'll talk about the ring spectrum in a little bit. Uh, so this is the, the model that it's going to use. In this fit, other absorbers like OCLO and HCHO, which uh, can be in the region, were uh, not allowed to vary. So these values are zero. And then the polynomial right here describes the light scattering, which I removed manually before, and it just looks something like this. I will note that this uh, has turned over the absorption features, so by taking minus the natural log of the ratio to get the absorptions on the positive direction. The result of the fit is then the residual right here, and the RMS value, 3.18 times 10 to the minus 4, is a figure of merit of this fit, describing how good this fit is. And that's typical what we'll get for our instrument. There is additionally an offset, which is a small uh, part of the fit that's trying to deal with scattered light within the spectrometer, an instrumental problem. And uh, we sometimes turn this on, sometimes turn this off. Uh, generally, this is a relatively small feature. If your offset is large, it probably means something is bad with your fitting. Okay, so this is what the spectrum looks like, the, the fit looks like for one of our spectra at a one degree elevation angle. We can switch to a different elevation angle. I'm just going to randomly go to one of the others, a higher elevation angle. and. Typically, what we'll then see is the amount of BRO will decrease, and the amount of O4 will decrease. You'll notice this number is smaller, 
and other things will be varying in the fit. Because those amounts are decreasing, the noise is actually increasing somewhat. But if you were on the same scale, the noise would look the same. So we can go through and look at different spectra like that. I can go to maybe spectrum 8. Now BRO is relatively small here, starting to get down towards noise levels. O4 still fit well, but getting smaller. And now we start to see a feature here called the ring spectrum. The ring spectrum is really starting to show up right now. The ring spectrum is a feature that's not actually a true spectrum, but instead due to light scattering in the atmosphere. Remember the spectrum that is our light source is the uh, sun's spectrum, and it has these strong Fraunhofer dips in it. As light is scattered in the atmosphere by inelastic scattering, things like rotational Raman scattering, that scattering shifts the wavelength of light and it tends to smooth out the overall spectrum because you fill in where there is very little light intensity from light scattering of more intense light at other wavelengths. That filling in of the dips is known as the ring spectrum or it's not actually a true spectrum because it's uh, the effect of light scattering, so we also call it the pseudo-spectrum. And it's very important to fit the ring effectively because it tends to be a very large feature. So we see this ring right here, and that ring is very important to, to fit. Clearly the fit is working pretty well with this. It just turned out that first spectrum that I showed you had relatively ring, little ring feature in it. The ring is very dependent on which the solar geometry, and so uh, it just turned out that the, this geometry had very little ring down low, but looking up higher, the ring became larger. Okay, so that's the QDOS uh, program. I want to go over here now to, if I right-click on the analysis window, I can look at the properties of our fitting routine. And you can see various different properties of the fit routine. The thing I really wanted to look at here is that, uh, I cancel out of that, I really wanted to view the cross-sections and uh, we can look at the cross sections. Oh, it won't let me because I'm running a fit. So I'm going to stop the fit and then click and view the cross sections. Now it'll show me the cross sections of each of the absorbers that we want to consider. Again, these cross sections are laboratory measured spectra of BRO, for instance, convolved with our instrumental resolution function that we've measured for this spectrometer. You have to measure that for every spectrometer and then use that to convolve the laboratory spectra to get good fits. So this is BRO, has this very characteristic feature. Because this window is good for BRO, we've picked it to have a lot of features in the window, and most of these other absorbers are hopefully relatively small in this window. It's additionally case, the case that O4 was picked to have a nice spectrum within this window. You don't want any of these to look like the polynomial you use because then they can blur together. And you want all of them to look different. This O4, uh, O3 here, you'll notice there's some overlap between this peak and this peak, this peak and this peak. They're not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they're a little bit different here, but there's no peak here where the BRO has a peak. So that's picked to be that way, so O3 and BRO won't be confused between the two. NO2 absorbs everywhere, it looks like that. Um, HCHO looks something like this, very different spectrum. Ring spectrum looks like this. And then OCLO looks something like this. So you generally want these absorbers to have different features within our window in order to get good fits. The last thing about this is that um, Sometimes you find that an absorber is really not present in your data. So for instance, for formaldehyde, we have found by fitting it that it's really not present or not observable in our spectra. 
Uh, so we turn it off. We tell it in the software not to fit that absorber. We always first fit with the absorber free, find that the absorber is absent, and then we go back and turn it off. Um, that's just a good practice to assure that you're not confusing that absorber into some other absorber or combination of absorbers. So the result of this fit is then the amounts, the slant column densities of various different species that we have. So if we go back to one of those spectra, we can run the analysis on that. It'll show us again the spectrum and then in the window our spectrum and the various different absorbers and then we're able to get out of this each of the amounts, slant column densities within this window. So now we've completed the fitting and we have got the slant column densities of various different absorbers that were in the spectra that we were looking at. And you could see that as a, I looked up through the sky, I got to a lower and lower amounts of BRO. So plotted right here is the slant column density of BRO versus the elevation angle. And you see that this starts at that value of the one degree elevation spectrum, 4.4, uh, and then it decreases on down. A nice thing about the DOAS fitting is it gives you error bars on each of those. So we see this elevation profile. What's in fact being plotted is something called the differential slant column density, DS or DSCD. And this is relative to the 90 degree zenith spectrum. Let's look at how that works mathematically. We originally presented Beer's law in this way, that the natural log of I over I naught is minus uh, sigma times S. To really have I naught, we should know the spectrum outside the atmosphere. And we don't generally know that. Our instrument's never been in space, so we can't measure that very well. So in fact, we made a measurement of I over I ref, not I over I naught, natural log of I over I ref. A nice thing about logs, however, is that the natural log of I over I ref can be broken into the natural log of I over I naught minus the natural log of I ref over I naught. If you look at your log rules, this is equivalent to I over I ref right here. We don't know I naught in either case, but uh, the difference between these two log terms is going to equal to minus sigma times s. So on the right hand side, we can identify that's minus sigma times the slant column density in the spectrum minus the slant column density at the reference. So we talk about ds, the change, the differential slant column density, ds, which is s minus s ref, at the reference elevation, that is comparing the zenith to the zenith, clearly this natural log gives zero right here, and the differential slant column density is zero. So that's why the value is zero, in fact with zero error bars at the zenith geometry. So all our measurements are relative to the zenith. If I picked a different reference, it would end up that some of them may become negative. And that's just saying there's less absorption at that view than there is at the reference view. We don't like negative numbers generally, so we usually pick the zenith, which has the least absorption in it as the reference, and all the other absorptions are positive. Okay, so uh, we now can visualize these data by looking at what we, what we call a colored time series. This is just a time series of the elevation prof scans that we've done. So this is the one that we just looked at. Uh, well, I guess 4.4 is somewhere in here. So there's a uh, amount of BRO at this one degree elevation colored by the red color, and then two degrees, it's this one, uh, three, five, 10, 20, on like that, uh, through this region right here. So we see nice smooth features to this. And these variations right here are variations in the amount of BRO and in the vertical profile of BRO. So we're gonna analyze these slant column density data to give us vertical profiles all throughout this region in our next tutorial. First thing I wanna do though before doing that is get to how we're going to understand aerosol scattering in the atmosphere. 
first off, aerosol light scattering is going to really matter to us for the path length. The more there's light scattering, the shorter the path length is going to be. We have something to save us here, though, in that the oxygen molecules uh, form a collisional dimer, the O2, O2, or also called O2, 2, or also called O4. And because we know the equilibrium that forms this collisional dimer, we know the concentration of the O4. So since we know its concentration and we measure its slant column density, we can then get the path length out of this. So the measurements of O4 tell you the path length, which is needed for the gas measurement because on this previous slide, this is both the amount of BRO that's around and the visibility, how long you're seeing. We want to get rid of that visibility part, and we can do it through these measurements of O4. So uh, we're going to get the path length via O4, and that's going to tell us also about the aerosol optical properties. Okay, a little bit more about the O4 molecule. There is an equilibrium between two O2s and O4. And this equilibrium constant tells you the ratio of the number density of O4 to the number density of O2 squared. And we can rearrange that to find that the number density of O4 would just be the equilibrium constant times the square of the number density of O2. This KEQ is roughly 1. It's a weak function of temperature. There's been a lot of laboratory measurements, so we have a good handle on that. But it's a lot easier, instead of dealing with all this, to just consider our spectrum of O4 as related to the square of the number density of O2. So because of that, we're going to measure O4 in a different unit, not truly a number density, but the square of the O2 number density. So let's work that through. The uh, surface number density of air is about 2.5 times 10 to the 19 molecules per centimeter cubed. Number density of air is just its mixing ratio, 0.21 times the number density of air. That gives you about 5 times 10 to the 18th. So the N of O4 is roughly the square of that. And so if we square 5E18, we get 2.5 times 10 to the 37. Now this crazy unit is molecules squared per centimeter to the 6. Now we're going to take this and integrate over a path length. And typically, we're going to be thinking about how thick the atmosphere is as the scale height of the atmosphere, which is on the order of 8 kilometers or 8 times 10 to the 5th centimeters. So the vertical column density, that is the slant column density when looking straight up of O4, is something on the order of 2 times 10 to the 43 molecules squared per centimeter to the 5th. This is a horrible unit right here, but that's the way we're going to measure slant column densities of O4. They're always going to be measured in this unit right here. And you're going to see my unit switches over to molecules squared per centimeter to the fifth instead of a true number density or a true, uh, in this case, slant column density. Okay, so on the same times as that previous spectrum's uh, BRO measurements, we also measured O4. I showed you some of those in the fitting. And this is a colored time series of the O4 observations, DSCD of O4 versus the time. And what you see is in that period, the actual visibility was decreasing. The O4 amount was decreasing like this. You see there's a lot of information here, and we measure it with very good fidelity. These error bars are quite small because O4 is a big absorber. And um, you can see that at this point, the red dots are under the yellow dots, and then the green, and then we go to the purple. But at this time, the red dots are higher than the other points. These changes are changes in the vertical profile of light scattering in the atmosphere. So we see a huge sensitivity to light scattering in the atmosphere, and that's how we're going to get aerosol information. And then we're going to feed that back into the fit to get a better understanding of where the BRO is vertically, or any trace gas. Let's just do a ballpark path length estimate, because that's a great thing to know for this technique. So uh, 
Early on the, this day that we were looking at right here, the low elevation O4 is something like 4 times 10 to the 43 molecules squared per centimeter to the fifth. So 4 times 10 to the 43, we're going to take that. We also know the surface number density. So if we imagine we were looking straight across at the surface, then we can ask how far do we see? And we just do this by simply saying that the we know the number density of O4, we know the uh, slant column density, and thus we get L. So we're going to divide it out and we find the number is about 16 kilometers right here. And that's a very typical view for max dois in the UV. You can see something like 16, 20 kilometers is about how high it gets when you get a pure Rayleigh atmosphere at 360 nanometers. On this day that we were looking at, clearly the visibility drops. It's about eight kilometers at the uh, down near the horizon right here, and it gets even worse visibility. So this change is due to visibility. It could also be due to clouds. So both clouds and visibility will show up. Clouds and aerosol scattering will affect these uh, O4 signals. So that's going to be the part of our next tutorial right here. Um, is going to be understanding this, but keep this number in mind. Clear sky, maybe you can see 20 kilometers, and you're going to be able to tell visibility reductions by the O4 measurements.